Thank you, Michael. As the title of this webinar suggests, some conditions are very difficult or actually impossible to replicate in physical testing, as shown in this dramatic image. I'd firstly like to discuss the challenges of physical testing and why it may be difficult or actually impossible. Firstly, you could have a large bore valve and this is awkward to test due to the sheer size. For example, we have works on a 30 inch bore diameter. The valve may be designed for large external loads, which could be difficult to replicate. The oil and gas industry continue to push the boundaries requiring design pressures in excess of 20 KSI. These are difficult to replicate and have safety implications. Temperatures in excess of 350 degrees Fahrenheit are common and again have safety implications. A while ago, we were involved in work for the Chardonnay's field where the flow rates were particularly high and unachievable by flow loop test facilities. Without analytical methods, this would have been untestable. It's all very well having these analytical tools, but they don't eradicate the need for physical testing. They are useful to give confidence in a valve design and a better understanding of its behavior while giving an opportunity for des design improvements. So the agenda for today, the presentation is split into three main areas, all focusing on the use of finite element analysis methods. Firstly, we will look at considerations when planning an analysis. We will then look at analysis techniques when validating a design. And lastly, we will look at the surface ability or functionality of the valve, whereby you look at the finer details of sealing and behavior um, ceiling or behavior of internal components. I, throughout this presentation, I will use surface ability and functionality interchangeably. As you can see, there will be a lot covered in the next 30 minutes, and due to time restrictions, there will be a top level overview of the topics. If you have qu any questions or would like to discuss anything in greater depth, please get in touch and we'd be happy to discuss. So, for the analysis insight, before undertaking any analysis work, take a step back and plan the method. Keep an end goal in sight. What do I need from this assessment? Consider the analysis of a swing check valve body under external loading. Here we have a bending moment about the X axis, which could be negative or positive. So we should be checking in both orientations because the stiffness of the body will differ. This analysis could be performed on the body alone, but it may well not be representative of the assembled valve. Including the bonnet um, within the analysis would be more realistic. By adding the bonnet, you may want to include the body bonnet fasteners too. But then you may ask yourself, should the gasket be included as well? I'd expect not, as the bending moment shouldn't influence the localized region around the seal. If a seal contact pressure assessment is required, a submodel can be used as shown here. We will look at this in a little bit more detail later. So back to the bending moment assessment. If we are able to use a half symmetry model, as you can see here, then um, that would be useful. And, but that is only applicable if we have bending moment in the X axis only. If we have bending moments in other orientations, then we will want to use a full model. The inclusion of internal components can add complexity to your analysis due to the contact specified between the seat rings or, and the ball or gate. This may be required for functional, require, uh, functional criteria assessments. We will discuss this a little later. Pressure vessels typically look for stress through the wall thickness between the wetted face and the outside surfaces. Corrosion allowance can impact on this wall section and needs to be removed. It can be, e um, it can be easy to remove the corrosion allowance from the valve branch, but the as we can see, as we can see here. However, it gets a little bit more complicated when we're looking at the inside cavity and the seat pockets. 
we've got a more complex geometry here where the corrosion allowance has been removed. I would typically use the fill command in the CAD software um, to get this area here and then use a solid extension um, for the corrosion allowance specified and then use a boolean subtract um, command to remove the corrosion allowance from the geometry of the valve. You may also want to consider machining tolerances to make sure that you've got the minimum metal. Cladding should also be um, thought of, um, considered and you may want to um, like model this so you can specify cladding material properties. By nature of valves, there are plenty of small features, such as pressure relief ports, holes, and threads, and seat um, seal grooves. A, discussion needs, a decision needs to be taken if the feature adds benefit to your analysis. Here we have an O-ring groove with a radii in the corners. You can see the cluster of nodes needed to represent the geometry. The more nodes your analysis has means the solution will take longer. By removing the radii, the node coat can be reduced. By removing the groove altogether, it can be simplified further. Keeping the end goal in mind, what do you need from this assessment? And if the local feature isn't adding benefit, you may want to remove it. A quick note on fatigue assessments here though, you may need those local features you may need the local features, but you can always add those back in later. A good way to give your de-featured analysis geometry a sanity check is to overlay the um, valve geometry file. It would be a similar check to when you're using your casting or your forging geometry. Moving on to analysis techniques. A structural capacity assessment can be considered in two parts. Does the loading um, satisfy the code? This would typically be if you had the loading information and the valve design. This could, be, this could be considered as a validation to code assessment. Another question could be, what is the maximum loading to satisfy the code? This would be if you had the code limits and the valve design. And we're going to call this a capacity assessment. Before we dive into the uh, structural capacity slides, a quick note on material properties. Your analysis outputs are only as good as your analysis inputs. So properties from material certs or test data are recommended. If you have an API flange, um, sorry, an API valve, uh, material yield strengths for the linear elastic approach are typically derated by way of a safety factor. If undertaking a HISC assessment, uh, the material guides are available in DNB and it is useful to use the same material model across an ASME and a HISC assessment. If the valve is intended for use at elevated temperature, the reduction in yield, ultimate tensile strength, and Young's modulus can be found in ASME 2. If your material is not referenced in ASME 2, then API 17G provides a derating factor dependent on material type and operating temperature. One of the most commonly used standards, ASME 2, um, sorry, ASME 8 Div 2, uh, alternative rules for construction of pressure vessels, references three material properties that can be used in part five design by analysis. There's the elastic stress analysis, where the materials are linear elastic, the limit load assessment, where you have a bilinear curve, and the elastic plastic assessment, where you have a more representative material model. We will look at these in detail now. So starting with the elastic stress analysis method, you post-process the results by way of categorizing the stress. This can be a little bit difficult when looking at a valve geometry, especially around the seat pocket. Allowable limits are conservative, so the plastic collapse will not occur. Just note that this is non-conservative for high um, heavy walled vessels which are typically used in the high pressure applications and therefore it is not recommended. 
limit load assessment uh, accounts for the yield point, but no hardening effect after that, as you can see by the horizontal line. Allowable limits are again conservative, so the plastic collapse will not occur. The elastic plastic assessment generated using guidelines in ASME 8 Div 2, or if you can get test data, that's uh, better. This is a more accurate representation um, of the material and the assessment for the protection against plastic collapse is um, a lot closer approximated. Back to validation to code. So which material model to use if you have a design and loading and want to know if it meets the code? The linear elastic assessment method can be a good place to start. You build your numerical model with the geometry you have prepared. Specify the contact between components, apply the boundary conditions and solve with the desired loading. Now to categorize the stress, um, in order to compare against the limits, you need to linearize your stress paths through critical sections, as shown on the slide now. This will be typically be around high areas of stress and particularly thin uh, areas in the wall section, which is why corrosion allowance and um, material, minimal material is important. The membrane and membrane plus bending stresses are then compared to allowable limits. If your design does not meet the linear elastic allowables, you can move on to the limit load or elastic plastic assessment if required. Now moving on to the capacity assessment. We would typically use the elastic plastic um, assessment method for this because the post-processing requirements are easier. As mentioned, and earlier, the elastic plastic allows plastic collapse to occur, so the method is more representative and less conservative. The table uh, 5.5 in ASME 8 Div 2 explains the global load places required. So again, you build your analysis model and you derive your material properties either from your synthetic curve that you have uh, created or from test data and then you work out if your uh, model or your solution will meet the global criteria. This typically requires the loads to be applied by a design factor. If the analysis solves and therefore converges at the required loading it is acceptable. You will also need to look at a local criteria whereby accumulated damage is calculated over a number of load steps. So we're just going to give Elizabeth a moment here to take a sip of water and I'll take the opportunity to thank those people who've already submitted questions and just to remind everyone you can actually submit your queries in this little questions box here and they'll be um, sent through to Elizabeth and myself for the end of the presentation. As Elizabeth mentioned because we can't cover everything in massive depth today we will respond to questions to just give you a call and have a discussion about a particular aspect. So please don't hesitate to do that. Okay, I shall hand you back now to Elizabeth who has had her sip of water. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Okay, just as a quick recap of what we've um, had a look at already. So we've already looked at the things to consider when setting up your valve assessment. We've then looked at ways to assess a valve and we are now going to look at the functional or serviceability uh, performance. So once your structural capacity has been determined, you may want to acknowledge the functional requirements. One example is this 12 inch split gate valve. You can see the split gate in there. Now, this valve has large bending moments and shear forces applied during operation. The valve uh, will sit at a 45 degree angle, which is why we've got an offset uh, loading coordinate system here. Ceiling faces between the seat and the split gate required verification before a PO was placed. As discussed in the geometry section, a full model was required because there is loading in all the orientations. 
contact representation uh, between the internal components was important for an accurate representation of the male and the female segment behavior. So as you can see, we've got frictional contact between the gait segments and also the body and the seat rings. We have frictionless contact between the body and the bonnet and the seat rings and the body, um, as well as the gait and the body down here. And then we've got a bonded contact for our bolts. Oops. Um, the actuator forces were included in order to get the correct representation of the gate to the seat rings. The contact pressure between the seat and the gate can be seen here on the right uh, when we've just got actuator forces in only. Uh, the contours are set to two times the operational uh, pressure and one and a half times the operational pressure. So you can see that we've got um, a nice band, thick band here, um, and this will be sealing. We did recommend to increase the torque to give a better sealing pressure, and this uh, image is with it increased. So, because it's a split gate valve, we needed to look at the bled and the unbled conditions. The images that you can see now are with pressure and actuator forces. The bled has a lower contact pressure, but does remain sealed. Now we can see this contact sealing with the worst case external loading applied. Again, the bled is worst case, but there is a seal maintained, even if it's quite thin down here. The, se the sealing was validated by physical testing and passed first time. You can see the rig on the right. It's worth noting that a high contact pressure between the seat and the gate can, be, can lead to excessive uh, compressive stresses and can crack any sealing surfaces. Compressive axial loading is normally subtracted from end cap loads, but you may need to be aware of the clamping between the seat and the gate or the ball if you are if they are particularly high. We will look at this in the thermal clamping in a moment. The seat seals can also be compromised by excessive seat ring distortion. We would typically extract radial deformation at the seat pockets using a cylindrical coordinate system and these deflections can then be discussed with the seal manufacturer. Let's now move on to the body and bonnet seal assessment and the sub-model that I mentioned earlier. Here we have the swing check valve assembly without its RTJ joint seal because we decided it wouldn't benefit the body assessment under external loading. If we wanted to verify the sealing of the gasket and ensure the bolt preload is adequate, we could create a cyclic symmetry model as shown here. A submodel is a quick to set up, it's a quick way to, um, because it's quick to set up and solve. And for assessments where components are constrained only by contact, in this case, the gasket, it can help convergence. Whilst contact is established between the, gate, uh, between the gasket and its seal groove, it is essentially floating so it can help to apply the bolt load as a displacement, then swap it to a preloaded force. This is typically helpful if the gasket is elastic plastic and the material is deforming. Just like the seat to gate contact pressure, a band of pressure exceeding the design pressure for a with a factor of safety can give confidence in seal performance. Bolt stresses can be extracted. This chart shows bolt stress um, relating to internal pressure. If the bolt is not required in this submodel, the analysis can be simplified further using a 2D assessment, which can be seen in the video.
Moving on, often within valve systems, the temperature of the liquids or gases can vary greatly. Problems can arise when there are induced thermal stresses, which might push um, areas close to the allowable limits or just over the limit. Additionally, without sufficient flexibility in the system, overconstraint can cause high compressive stresses axially due to thermal expansion of components. Thermal clamping can occur when the seat and gate expand due to temperature um, more than the valve body. This, is typic uh, this can be typically um, assessed by hand calculations. However, if you need to determine the actuator force required to operate the valve, you may like to do an analysis. And this is shown here where we've got the thermal um, the internal faces specified with a higher temperature than the external faces. And you can see the thermal gradient uh, between the wetted faces and the outside. To summarize the topics discussed in this webinar, Ensure that the geometry and material model is appropriate for the application. Functional considerations provi provide confidence in sealing and performance in operation. Physical testing can be difficult or important. Analytical methods can help to understand a valve design, but physical testing will provide the ultimate confidence. Always keep the end goal in mind. What do you need from the analysis? We have not discussed the effects of erosion or buildup of hydrates, which can also affect a valve performance, but a CFD analysis would be required to look at this, and that can be a topic for another webinar. So that concludes the presentation material for today. Um, thank you for your attention, and next we will try to answer a few of the questions which have been submitted. As I mentioned earlier, please note that any questions we cannot get to today will be answered by email. And equally, we'll be reaching out to those of you who've requested a further discussion. I should also note that the, um, our email addresses are on the screen, so by all means, feel free to reach out to us directly as well. So, just a couple of questions for you, Elizabeth. Um, there was a question came in about slide 14, and that was about the information needed to generate an elastic plastic curve. Yes, so if you don't have... Um test data available you can use um, there's an annex in ASME um, that will give you the information uh, the guidelines of how to do this you would typically need your Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio as well as your yield strength and the materials are classified in um, as in types so you need to know what type of material you are using right okay doke and let's just pick another one. So uh, another one here was, you, you were talking earlier about heavy walled vessels, um, and you mentioned that linear elastic materials were non-conservative. So why why is that, and what? So um, in design, there's information about this actually in the um, high pressure, high temperature uh, code, right. um, API 17 TR8, and in the uh, design of higher pressures, the wall thicknesses have increased. Um, and the reason for the nonlinear uh, being non-conservative is that the stress distributes in a nonlinear fashion uh, through a, a thicker section. And this isn't um, replicated in a linear elastic right. uh, yeah. assessment. So it's better to use um, a material model that allows the stress to distribute and then mm -hmm. it's a lot uh, more representative. Yeah, so I think that's probably something that Rich Farnell picked up on, didn't he, it in the correct. HBHT web, uh, webinar. Yeah. So if anyone wants to know more about that, it's worth going back onto the Knowledge Library and having a look at that particular webinar from before Christmas. Okie doke. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to move on there. Um, and just to tell people about the next webinar, which is expected to be scheduled for April. So please keep a look out across the usual channels for topic and date information. Um, as a reminder, please look out for a link to a recording of this webinar in your inbox.
and a PDF copy of the slides. And please feel free to share those with your colleagues too. And that leaves me with the final task of thanking Elizabeth for sharing her knowledge today, to thank Kate and Linz for their work behind the scenes, and to thank you for joining us today. Thank you.